with knowledge and experience to help the end user, the investor. That's amazing. I, w- I have a question initially for you. How did you know that that was what you wanted to do initially? If you started from the very beginning doing um, this work in the financial industry, how did you know that was what you wanted to do? How did that spark be become lit in, within you? It was funny because I went to Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, and there was an oldie discount across the street. And I go, God, if I was just smart enough, because isn't that as women, we always question our skill when it comes to money. I go, if I was only smart enough, maybe I would become a stockbroker. And little did I know in my last class in college, um, my partner who at the time, um, he was my study partner and he goes, hey, Cindy, what are you gonna do with your marketing degree? And I'm like, probably sell computers, I don't know. He goes, well, why don't I set you up with this interview? The person who cuts my hair, her husband works for the equitable. Um, You know, we were in a finance class. I said, okay. Can you get me an interview? Make a long story short, I, I interviewed with the Equitable, stayed with them 17 years and got completely licensed. Little did I know I wouldn't be selling computers. I would be representing financial products. So, Wow, that's amazing. Good for you for sticking with it and taking um, a different approach than I feel like most women know that they can. And I feel like that's so important to be an example for the women that you know, want to be in that industry and who might not know where to start. And that's just incredible that 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 was what you were able to do. Um, So to begin with, I'm sorry, I'm just going to pull up my notes really quick. Um, So we've obviously been at a really unique era of finance and specifically for women in their 20s, you know, just getting their feet on the ground, um, learning about finances, this this pandemic has been a really unique time to, to one, have the time to even learn about it. I feel like it has given people a lot of time to just sit down and really dig into what are their finances? How can they prepare for the future? What does the future even look like? Because the future is different every day right now. Yeah. Uh, so it's brought up a lot of different questions about the future of our finances. So can you just talk about the things that you have learned just even being in a pandemic in general and some of the light bulbs that have gone off in your head just in regards to how things are changing how things have changed um and where we are going with fi- with the financial future of of what we're at in the pi- in the pandemic okay so first of all the money business a lot of people are out there um trying to figure this out because it wasn't like we went to elementary school and junior high and high school and had a class on finance. We had a class on history, English, science, but the missing ingredient in my professional opinion is that our school system has failed us. There's only six states in the country today that require a half a year of finance. Here we work our entire life, go to college, spend all this money, and no one teaches us what to do with the money. So I just think it's it's been a failure in our educational system. And then you talk about the financial service industry. I was just reading a statistic. 58% of financial planners don't offer financial literacy, which is education. So here, you know, the millennial generation, mm-hmm. I think, is really searching out and wanting to learn. Because their parents, you know, have gone through some tough times, some major market corrections. And the millennials have witnessed this and they don't want to make that mistake. They are thirsting for knowledge. They want to know what they need to do and how they need to do it. And so I think it's a generation that's very open-minded. They want to learn and they want to know the truth behind investing. And I think the first thing a person can do is, you know, find an advisor that creates a financial literacy platform. Now, I'm not saying all advisors do or don't, but just here at Synergy Financial, we have books for the readers. We have videos for the ones who don't like to read. We have podcasts. We do radio. So I have made it my priority. If you go to my website, you'll see how robust it is. It's just not a a, a website that's put together. There's a lot of thought in respect to knowledge, education, because we know if we give you facts-based research, fear will no longer be a part of your process. You need to know the facts. We need to take out fear out of the equation and we need to be integral and straightforward when it comes to your finances. So 
there's a lot of different ways to get educated. Books is one way. The problem with the books and the industry for people like Susie Orman and David Ramsey who wrote books, they really just talk about micro financial literacy, like how much can you save? How much debt should you have in a simplistic investment program? Where I have taken it is a whole different spectrum. And, I, and, and me and my ghostwriter could not find a book on macro financial literacy, looking at politics, looking at economics. And how did we get here? Why is the millennials making 20% less than baby boomers at the same age? Why do millennials have all the student debt on their hands? Why is their net worth going down? There's reasons and it's politically and economically driven. So if you understood political and economic risk, along with stock market risk and bond market risk and inflation risk, I think you have a better understanding of the big picture. And then in my book, I give you solutions or strategies to combat the forces of risk. Because let me tell you this, millennials don't like to take risk if they don't know what they're doing. They would rather be conservative than bet the house, you know, because, and the reason I know this, I have a 401k I, I service in San Diego. The baby boomers are more aggressive than the millennials. And I asked them, I go, why is that? Millennials don't want to take on like, I'm just going to hit the home run. They're, they're methodical. They're detailed. They're thirsting for information. So where this book might come into hand is everything you're hearing about on the news, political and economic risk that no one's taken the time to research. And yes, it did take me hidden forces as chapter one that took me a year to write. So I think if you give people the truth, you give them facts and research that knowledge is an information that, that you would Google on the internet anymore. It's real. It's something that you can embrace because at the end of the day, empowering an investor to make a good decision is liberating you, putting out all that negative energy and saying, hey, listen, I can accomplish my goals. I'm not going to put my head in the sand. I'm going to march forward. I'm going to find an advisor. I'm not going to do this myself. It's complex. And I'm going to take the time. Mm -hmm. That's, if I could say one thing, time. Yeah, I feel like we just did a, a event last week and we talked a little bit about investing, but I feel like the biggest thing that comes across from a lot of our members in our community is that they don't even know where to start. I mean, even just in the in the education and like you said, the the literacy of it all, like knowing the the terms and the terms, the, yeah, and the, the concepts and the concepts and even just knowing a starting point of like, okay, how much money do I need to have in my emergency fund? How much money do I need to have in order to invest? What is a 401k? What is a Roth IRA? Like yeah. what are those things? So I love that you're making the space for people to know that and a, an easy place for them to go to learn, meet them where they're at. You know, we do the same thing at She Factor where we have a podcast and a book and videos and, and events, because I think with millennials, that's another thing is they, um, it's, they won't learn it unless it's, being being uh, presented to them in a way that they can understand it yep. and everyone learns so differently. So I love that you have all these different resources. I want to talk really quickly. Uh, you and uh, a stat that I've seen you share about is that COVID has showed us that 40 to 50% of Americans don't even have 40% or sorry, $400 in their emergency fund. Mm -hmm. So as a starting point, especially for people that are just starting this financial journey, what are the basics of what you should have set up. What is an emergency fund? And do you, how much money do you have to have to invest? Like, do you have to have a certain amount? What does that look like? Okay, good. That's a great question. Uh, and I'm going to relate it to my life because I, I moved here from Southern California. Uh, I'm from Detroit originally. And I said, what was the first thing I was going to do? I was going to build an emergency fund. So where does that start? It starts by looking at your monthly expenses. So let's say you put together a budget and your expenses are 2000 a month. A good starting point before you even start investing is to build, okay, my expenses are 2000, three months would be about 6,000. Okay, I probably should have about $6,000 in my emergency fund. I mean, none of us expected this pandemic and the food lines across this country were unbelievable because people didn't have an emergency fund. Now, 
When I was 22 years old, I could save 50 bucks a month. That's where it started. I came to Southern California with zero money. I mean, a couple thousand dollars in my, in my checking account, but that was gone after 90 days. So <laughs> I had to make a decision at that point in my life. Um, do I get started or do I just work on paying down my credit card? So what I thought to myself, I go, you know what it is? I'm going to get started. I don't care if it's 50 bucks a month. I don't care if it's a hundred. At the end of the year, I'm going to add up all the money I saved. And I'm going to put that in a, in a you know, just a, a workbook type of, you know, matrix. And I'm going to monitor that every year. And guess what happened? As I saved 50, the next year I saved a hundred. Then I saved more. And then, you know, a lot of us are going to say, well, I can't even afford to save. Mm. What am I supposed to do about that? Okay, let me tell you what I did. I could barely afford to pay my bills. I had to get a second job. My mom goes, oh, good, you can come back to Michigan. No, I'm not coming <laughs> back to Michigan. I'm going to go find a second job. I'm going to share a room with a roommate. So I did these little things that were practical and logical. Because could I spend $500 on dinners a month? Absolutely. Could I spend $250? Sure. So it was a fact of the matter of starting somewhere, building the emergency fund. And if you have a job that offers a 401k, the first thing I can tell you is do try to set up something that you can take advantage of the match. Yeah, I don't care how much debt you have, save for retirement, pay yourself first, the debt's always gonna be there. Mm, yeah, that's so important. Um, hold on, I pinned your video here. I'm gonna un unpin it so you can see both of us. Um, so with regards to your 401k, mm -hmm. what is, is that enough to invest and have a financially free future? I mean, talk about in your even 40s, 50s, 60s, yeah. like is your 401k enough to live the life that you want to live freely in that time period? Or are there other things that you have to do in order to make that happen? So good. So we establish a short term, which I call an emergency fund and long term, I call 59 and a half retirement or later, because that's when you can have access to your 401ks and IRAs. So somewhere in between, some people even have a medium goal, which might be for a home, for kids, for whatever the goals might be. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you, doing my research, average Americans save. So for instance, I'm going to use a rough number, an even, even number. Let's say I made $100,000 a year. Average Americans save about six to eight percent of their income. Okay, where the rule of thumb is, a lot of experts say save ten to fifteen percent of your income if you want to replace it over a twenty to thirty year window. Okay, so if you want the same lifestyle or even seventy percent of your lifestyle, a lot of experts use the rule of seventy. If I make a hundred. The goal is to accomplish 70000 in income from all sources, Social Security, your pension, and your savings. So what is that going to entail? I remember a lot of our clients, maybe a handful are saving 20% of their income. They're the best savers. And typically, I ask them, so you saved 20. Who taught you that? Someone <laughs> typically, that isn't something you just wake up and say, I'm saving 20% of my income. Of course, if you can, that's amazing. Seven is a good start increasing it because a lot of these companies today give you a two to three percent match so if you put in three or four and they're matching three i got seven i'm average america mm -hmm. so what we have to consciously do is say okay this is my income should i put 10 to 15 percent in the 401k yes if you have your emergency fund met you might not be able to start with 10 to 15%. You might only be able to start with the 3% that you get the match on. That's okay. But get that emergency and then your medium term. So I look at investing in three buckets, short term, medium term, and long term. Mm -hmm. And you take a percentage of your income. So let's say you make 100,000. If I save 10%, that's $10,000 or $800 a month. That's a little bit steep for me. So maybe cut that in half. Is that achievable? Is that a feasible? Or maybe to cut in half one more time. But you owe it to yourself. And this is the psycho psychology between that I actually put into my mind when I first start saving. I work 60 hours a week and I have nothing to show for it at the end of the week because I'm not saving any money. I'm not doing that. I am going to save money no matter what it takes. Because 25 years down the road, 
if I haven't missed it, especially if it's a little bit of money, then I will accumulate a lot of money because compound interest really helps. So psych it's all psychological too. You got to play games with yourself. You got to play games with your finances. Like watch your finances grow. Start small, increase it. It's, it's a self-talk. You got to talk to yourself because it comes down to goal settings. Even as a financial planner, I can't force anyone to save, right? Mm -hmm. It has to come from within. So it's something you have to decide. It's like losing weight. I'm going to keep eating a lot or I'm going to lose weight. I mean, it's something you have to decide you want to do that you feel it's important. And you have to look at your life circumstances. Look at your parents. I mean, I'm a baby boomer. My kids tell me, mom, we're not working as hard as you do. You have it all wrong. I said, okay, we're not going to buy a lot of things. We're going to, we're going to be minimalist. We're going to save our money. We're going to delay our gratification. You baby boomers came out and made a lot of money. It was hard to delay your gratification. And that's true. Yeah. So it comes down to psychological forces within your mind um, of what you're going to do to get started. What do you advise how do you advise people to work through those psychological pieces of your money? Like, I know that even in the work that I've done personally, there's been a lot of, I, I don't necessarily like to use the word trauma because it's not necessarily trauma, but there's a lot of pieces that you take from your family history, from your parents, from the experiences that you've had in your life. So in order to start with a clean slate and create the most wealth for yourself, how do you work through those those psychological pieces and, and how have you done that in your past? Okay, that's a great question because my mother and father never brought up money. Our entire, I thought we were rich and here <laughs> my parents, my dad worked for GM. He says, we almost lost the house. I go, you did? <laughs> they never really talked about money and I'll tell you why. My parents didn't have money, right? They were lucky. They fed us. They paid their bills. So having money wasn't anything they wanted to burden their children with, Okay. And as soon as I finished college, we were so lucky because us baby boomers, a lot of baby boomers didn't have debt. Okay. Mm -hmm. We were able to get through college, pay our way or have our families pay our way. So, you know, I had an advantage. I was in the financial service industry. I needed to set an example for my clients, right? Oh, so you don't save and you're telling me to save. Okay. How does that work? So um, from that aspect, I, I didn't know anything about money when I got into the business. Um, and so I, I told myself, I think the psychological forces I was fighting is I didn't really know anything. My parents didn't talk about savings or, uh, you know, they didn't do coupon cutting. You know, my husband on the other hand, their, his parents were very frugal. Okay. So he knew what the value of the dollar was more than me because my parents didn't talk about it. And when, I, when us baby boomers came out making all the money, it was easy to spend, spend, spend. Then we got caught up in debt and then we learned our mis from our mistakes. So a lot of times we have to make a mistake to learn. Why make a mistake? I have a mentor, have a financial planner, have someone who can coach you emotionally, psychologically, and they say, hey, you want to retire in 30 years? This is how much you need to save. You could even do that online today. I mean, isn't there a lot of resources? Yeah. You can put your income in. I want to retire in 30 years. I want to make 6%. What do I need to save? Mm -hmm. So the millennials really have an advantage over the baby boomers because you guys are tax savvy and there's so many resources out there. But so it comes to that psychological commitment in your mind that you're going to get started. Now you asked the question. Well, how much money do you need to talk to a financial planner? You know, I've always left it open to my practice. I said yes to everybody. I mean, most CFPs that Fidelity won't talk to you unless you have a million dollars. A lot of CFPs say, wait, maybe 250 to 500. So, you know, there are new planners starting off that are willing to take on smaller clients. But at the end of the day, we at Synergy Financial have kept our doors open for everyone. And people are like, everyone? Yes, because everyone, I was from the mentality, my parents raised us with thinking about the underdog, okay? So if someone came through the front door and only had $5,000, would I sit down with them? Yes, because no investor should be left behind. And yes, it's about the money. I get it. It wasn't about the money. We want to help. We want to get you where you need to go. And it doesn't take a lot of meetings to accomplish that. It's just breaking down what I call the bad word, your budget. People are like, <laughs> I don't have a budget. What are you asking me for a budget for? Make a budget. 
These are these psychological steps that people think this. Oh, I don't know. I, I have too many bills. I'm not even going to start it. So the sooner you get started and face in the reality of your situation, whether good, bad, or indifferent, the better off it's like getting through, not avoiding it. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. And that was definitely the experience I had. I mean, as raised by a single mom who had a very successful business, it's actually funny because we didn't even really talk about finances that much. much. And, and maybe because I didn't ask the questions, I wasn't curious about it, but I also had this vast experience of like, I had mom who had a successful business, but on my dad's side of the family, I had family members who were just striving to get by, who maybe were hopping from motel to motel, who were living in a trailer. Like it was uh -huh. very, very different financially. Very different, huh? <laughs> um, but I feel like for me, when I got to college, I was a little bit irresponsible with my money because I didn't know how to manage it. I didn't That's have a budget. Cool. And then after college, I just ignored it completely because for that reason, I just didn't want to deal with it. There's too many bills. You know, I, I was just going to pay paycheck to paycheck. And the second I finally sat down with myself and was like, okay, let's go through and just actually see how much money I'm bringing in, how much money I'm putting Perfect. out where I can cut down. It's a really empowering experience. I feel like a lot of people avoid because they're afraid of the consequences of it, but really you're just creating better consequences for yourself by knowing every penny that you have going in and every penny that you have going out, which is something that has, it's changed everything for me financially, even in just the last year. It's been super empowering. Oh, good. So see, Tori, that's exactly what you did. Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. So I want to talk about then investing. So I've dabbled in investing. I have a Roth. I have a 401k. Perfect. Um, I have some money in the stock market. But I think for a lot of millennials, you know, what they see is what they know is what they see, which is the game stops of the world. The, you know, people buying houses. I also, I bought a house a couple, two years ago, wow. the cryptocurrency, the stock market, you know, especially during COVID, we've seen that fluctuate so, so drastically. So there's so many ways that you can invest, invest your money. But then like you were talking about at the beginning, there's also a lot of risk that goes into some of these buckets as well. So um, as, as somebody who might be trying to manage or even just like understand where the, I, I don't want to say safest because investing shouldn't feel safe, but where, where you get the most return for your investment might be, especially in your twenties and thirties. Um, where do you start, you know, depicting all of, or like really digging through that and figuring out what type of investing is best for you at what stage in your life? That's a fantastic question. And this is where it gets a little complicated, okay? Mm -hmm. So most people know you have a bank. You can use a bank as an investment tool. Well, the interest rates have gone to almost zero, right? So that is no longer a place you're going to put your money. I mean, because there were years ago. I remember when I was in college, bank rates were 15%, okay? Mm -hmm. So now you have two other buckets. You turn on CNBC, you hear about your friends and people are setting up Robinhood, right? Okay, you got the stock market you can buy. That's an asset class. You've heard of gold. Well, okay, that's another asset class because people talk about gold because they're worried about the dollar right now. And you have bonds. That's people lending money. So, so the question that you have to post yourself, as you add more buckets, it gets more complicated, right? But what I have done for a lot of our investors is introduce these different asset classes, like venture capital, like commercial real estate, like private credit, mm -hmm. like gold and silver. And so what's happened is for years and years in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, that two asset class model of stocks and bonds did fabulous, eight, 10%. But in the last 20 years, things have changed. That two asset class model that people have relied on, that has been dependable, um, is now changing because the returns in the last 20 years has done almost half what it's done 20 yeah. to 40 years prior to that. So something's changed. And where the, my book comes into place is explaining some political and economic risk of free markets, deregulation, tax rates. There's been a lot of things that are hidden from investors that I have, that I believe have created 
what we're seeing in the markets, lackluster returns from where we were in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So it becomes even more challenging for all investors, whether you're sophisticated or unsophisticated, is learning about these asset classes. Because at the end of the day, I can tell you one thing, don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? Spread it out. But I do think, and again, being in the business 35 years, the future of investing is going to be, in my opinion, a multi-asset class model where you can get into asset classes like commercial real estate that have potentially beat the market the last 20 years and 30, 40 years that most investors don't even know about. Right. Or new asset classes such as, you know, other commodities or private credit and structured notes. These are asset classes that have only been available for the elitists, the endowments and the institutions, and they are here for you and me today. But the question is, how do you empower yourself with the knowledge? That's why I think it's challenging for these young people to try to go at it themselves. Because yeah. it's very risky in the stock market, as you know, with GameStop. You know, Wall Street can use derivatives, large amounts of derivatives. They use these electronic trading systems. It puts us as little clients really at a disadvantage for whipsaw. I mean, the Dow dropped 40% last year between March, what was it? March 13th and March 23rd. I mean, I've never seen the stock market drop that fast in such a small, that's scary stuff. Yeah. So people have to really wake up and say, hey, is there more that I can add to give myself more dynamic diversification? And the answer is absolutely. And chapter eight talks about alternative investments that investors like you and I can participate in. So I want to talk a little bit about the American dream, because this is something that you touch on in the book and something that um, myself, having a mom who built a very successful company um, and now working in education, she's really always preach you know she wants to keep the american dream american dream alive for our generation and i think that's something that's been lost in our generation that people aren't really striving for or that they don't believe is is realistic for them anymore so what does the american dream mean to you and how can we use money and investing and in our financial future to really achieve or create that american dream for ourselves so that's a great question. You know, typically the American dream is one generation's better than the next, right? The millennials already say, wait a minute, we have more debt than our parents. You know, um, we get paid 20% less than our parents when it comes to wages. So the question is, how are we going to combat those forces? Because wage, wage um, decreases over the last 20 years, you know, working for corporate America is going to be a fair game as we had. And the question that you have to ask yourselves is this, can I create and be, um, create my own financial future through my own business? So I think you're going to see a lot of these young millennials venture off to their own practices. Um, they're going to come up with innovative and um, different strategies to create the American dream. Because I think working for corporate America with, you know, in the last 20, 30 years with the stagnation of wages and inflation going up and the devalue of the dollar, it's really going to be tough for millennials. Um, and I'm not saying you can't make it. You definitely, you know, like Southern California, where the cost of living is very expensive. A lot of my baby boomer children are not living in Southern California. They're having to move other places so they can experience the American dream. Because if you live in these high income, high inflationary areas, I can see why a lot of these young kids in this area are giving up on it. And the other ones are fighting back like you. You're, 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 you're setting up your own business, you're using your, your focus, your creativity, your imagination to come up with strategies that can help you experience the American dream. Because I think for the millennials, it's, it, you know, it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, I feel like that, I mean, even starting in corporate America when I was out of college, you know, it you barely really make, you know, they say there's this big flashy salary, but at the end of the day, once you pay taxes, it's really not much more than minimum wage. And there's a lot of promise from these organizations and these companies and just corporate America in general that you'll get somewhere, that you'll get to bigger, better places. Um, and I think that was something that was really frustrating for me was chasing that and not feeling like I could ever achieve it because it 
it was such a grind. And I guess this leads into some of those historical and economic forces that you talk about within the book. And we've touched on a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate on is like how things have changed and these hidden forces that are affecting us that we don't necessarily see, especially as millennials and even Gen Z who is coming up and now graduating college and entering the workforce. It's scary. And I think the something you've obviously continued to touch on is knowledge and how we can how how we can use knowledge to our power. But um, what are some of those other hidden forces that we haven't touched on that maybe we need to be more aware of, we need to do more research on, we need to, to really break down and understand how they affect us in our life? It's funny that you asked that question because my daughter studies at, at, her, at our home because she's getting her bachelor's degree and she has all her friends studying there. And I start sharing these hidden forces and they're just like, oh my God, I, I never knew about this. I didn't learn about this. In fact, my ghostwriter has a son who graduated at USC, top in his class as an economist. And he said, I never learned about this in college. So I think it's sort of kept quiet. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that needs to go public in, in so these hidden forces. Before you di dive into some of these hidden forces, do you think that it's kept more private on purpose? Like that the the disadvantage to the investor, you know, gives more money to the bigger organizations and, and um, you know, the elitists and the et cetera, the, the people on top. Okay, I read 37 books on neoliberalism to get my first book out. And I'm gonna give you an opinion. Okay, this is just the, my opinion. I think the educational system has kept this in the dark and they haven't taught us enough because I think if we all knew what we should know, I think there could be a lot of uh, what you see going on today, right? You see a lot of fighting back, a lot of protests. People are upset. They're like, who took my money? <laughs> I mean, like, Where's my money? I can't even get by. The harder I work, the less I have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it really came down, you know, in the 1970s, we all remember we had the Vietnam War. I mean, you guys may not have us baby boomers knew the Vietnam War, we got off the gold standard mm -hmm. and there was hyperinflation. You guys were just babies. But, you know, a lot of people lost trust in the government because of what was going on at the time. And they go, you know what? Let's just shift the control to corporate America. And you know, when you give the control of corporate America and they have the money to change the rules, and I call that regulation, mm -hmm. you know, that's where the inequality comes in. Because, you know, an economic ideology of Milton Friedman, let's benefit the shareholders of a corporation. Okay, that's not you and I, the employees, the stakeholders, that's the top 10 or whoever's at the top. Mm -hmm. Do whatever you can to benefit the shareholders because they'll give the money to the people. Good luck with that. I mean, if you look at President Trump who lowered corporate tax rates, I don't want to be political here. He said that the corporation would give the money back in 2018. Well, they bought their stock back with $1 trillion. They didn't give it to their people. So I think that ideology to benefit the top created inequality, stagnated our wages, um, created greed and fraud. I mean, let's take a look. You guys know the credit crisis. The markets dropped 57. You remember the tech crisis in 2000. Markets dropped 40. I mean, someone had to bail out those guys. The mm -hmm. Federal Reserve bails everyone out. I mean, I wish we could get a bailout. <laughs> I mean, they bail everybody out. They lower interest rates. And it gives the corporation even more reason to become more aggressive and buy back their stock. So they're taking... I read this in The Evil Genius. It just came out recently. Oh, my God. This... This floored me. 90% of the profits are going to buying back the stock. Mm -hmm. So that's where I come and say, is corporations loyal to us anymore? I don't, I mean, based on that information in his book, I'm looking at that as hidden forces of capitalism that's uncontrolled. I believe in capitalism, but when it comes to a point that the elitists are buying the laws, they're doing the, they're, they're buying, um, the politics, the campaign contributions, it's really going against Main Street. And that's why I believe today, more than ever, there are social issues in America today that is inequality. There's eight men that dominate half the world's riches. And I can, I relate this to the 1920s during the Gilded Age, because there were three men who get, so, you know, capitalism needs to be buttoned up a little bit, tightened up, you know what I mean? And how do you do that? you get different people in office. Yeah. I mean, the baby boomers are getting old, right? 
you vote with your money. <laughs> well, I think sooner than later, the baby boomers will be out of office, right? As much as, you know, I mean, the oldest yeah. one, he's, he's in office right now. He's in his 80s. We need young people educated. The millennial generation, this is another uh, statistic I read in the other book, uh, Sociopaths in Power, that the millennials are the most educated population the United States has ever had. And they're getting paid 20 percent than baby boomers, you know, and, and I think millennials get a bad rap. You know, they have a reputation of not working hard and not caring about their finances. I think they got that all wrong. Mm -hmm. I think millennials really care about their finances and they, you know, these corporations put them on salary. And like you said earlier, Tori, you know, between working 60, 70, 80 hours, you are making minimum wage. Right. And. You know, millennials are being used as human capital, as, a, as I read in the book, um, Sociopaths in Power, okay? So it is an uphill battle to get these young people in office who can change the laws, tighten up the laws. And I am not a, and you'll read in my book, you will not be able to know if I'm a Republican or a Democrat because I wanted to stay neutral. I wanted people to get the facts and let them come up with their own assessment. Because a lot of people write books and like, okay, this guy's a Republican. Okay, this guy's a Democrat. I made it very neutral because I wasn't here to side with anybody. I'm here to present the facts and let the Americans know how they can fight these forces. Right. Well, I think something that my mom has always rang true to me in raising me as a single mom and as an entrepreneur is that we all agree on the problems. We all agree what the problems are. We just have different opinions on on how to solve them and the sweet spot is coming in meeting in the middle and i think that's the beauty of millennials is that they are in that middle spot like they see the extremists of both sides yeah i feel like most millennials most of us are in that middle we are we we have the information available to us we we definitely i feel like just in my experience as being 25 years old like most of my friends don't fall either way we we just want to you know, believe what we believe and then work together to make that difference. And I think that's, you know, I love that you come at that approach with, with your book, because I think especially when it comes to finances, you know, the beauty does happen in the middle and we have to create a system that works for everyone. And, and even, you know, what was that last week, a week and a half ago was equal payday. And there's still so much work for us to do. And it's like, how do we find a solution using the smartest generation there is out there. I didn't know that. I love that stat. Um, but by not getting lost and overwhelmed by the information that's out there, but by using our own opinions and beliefs to come together to create that. Well, I think it says go to the experts, get the information, get the facts. You know, how, and I have a second book coming out called Feminine Courage, Regain yeah, Your Financial Destiny. Wait. In fact, oh, I can't wait to get that one. And I'm really proud of that one. Um, but the thing is, is what I found from the research for women to have equality with men, it really comes down to financial literacy. Yeah. So women can't say, well, my husband does it. Oh, I'm not smart enough. I go, how, I mean, there are more women graduating with PhDs than men today. Okay. How smart do you have to be to add a few numbers together? I mean, it's really, we've been marginalized. We've been kept out of the equation and we, you know, I think it's just the stereotype. Women are, are as smart as men. We don't need to walk in front of men. We don't need to walk behind men, but we need to walk aside of men and start participating because women, the research says they want the knowledge. They want to be respected. They want their opinion to matter. They don't want to be talked down to and, and talked in a condescending way because that's the research of what women say about male advisors. We want to be able to work together with our advisor. And sometimes my clients give me the solutions. If you're not listening and not working together as a team, how are we going to accomplish the goal? If I'm like, oh, I'm all in money. I'm the expert here. You need to listen to me. No, it's really a collaborative engagement and finding out really where the concerns and what the goals are and together. Now, remember, it's not just the planner. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that the planner and the investor both come together and have some level of accountability in the equation. Right. 
And I think millennials are, I mean, I use the word financial literacy to millennials and they put a big grin on their face and they want, they want, oh God, can I get your book? I remember talking about my book. I was in Georgia for a meeting. Oh, here's my card. Millennials are really excited about uh, embracing knowledge. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, what, what do you think? Oh, I mean, last year we did our first, we've really just started doing these virtual events as of last March. And our first uh, finance event was last April. And that was our one of our most attended events. Wow. And we had so many questions afterwards of, okay, how do I invest my money? Where do I start? What, it, what kind of budget should I set up? Where, where should I go to research more? And then this last event that we did last week, it was the same thing. I mean, we had like 25 questions submitted. Wow. Just to, if people are, especially women, I feel like are so yes. curious. They, they love having the information so that they can make the decision for themselves. But I feel like there, there is this factor of too much information and, and oh, yes. like this, this information overload of, okay, there it's this overwhelm. So um, yes, I 1000% agree with you. I think there's this huge curiosity and this, this need and this want to be empowered by their finances and to learn more so that they can empower themselves instead of relying on their husband or relying on their boyfriend or, you know, yeah. I've learned a lot from my boyfriend. I'm not going to lie. He's done yes, it. Right. But, um, and we, we bought a house together for that reason. You know, he's taught me a lot about, about, um, saving and investing, but I've also, also taught him a lot about starting a business and what that looks like and becoming That's awesome an working together. I call it mutualism in book two. Mutualism yes. is coming together, not being arrogant, not being insecure, coming together with a calm. I love that story. That's exactly the way it needs to be. Yes. Like let's empower each other to make decisions rather than, right. I, I think that there is a lot of insecurity and like, well, I should know this. So I'm, I'm not even going to bring it up kind of like the budgeting. Like I should oh, have, yes. but that's I don't know point. where to start. <laughs> you know, that's a great point. That's exactly, they feel there's a lot of shame when you bring up money, people feel shame. Like, Oh my God, I don't know this. I'm embarrassed. I don't even want to tell her what I, I'm not going to set an appointment because I'm not going to share anything with her. I'm too embarrassed. Yeah. And so that's, you know, a qualified uh, advisor is critical because you get into the internet and the digital, digital age, you can have anyone agree with you. And they call that, you know, and, and now that people have access to information, they almost feel smarter than their advisor, right? <laughs> information is a knowledge. And they call that the Dunning-Kruger effect that is in all industries because we have access to information and everyone now feels they're a little bit, it's called a cognitive bias that they feel smarter than they actually are. Mm -hmm. So I think the more you learn, the more you're going to say, oh my God, I don't know anything about this subject. I should find a qualified advisor. I, and I hate the word financial plan. I like it a financial coach because a coach has to motivate. They have to explain, they have to educate. And it's a process. It's not like, oh, come on to my office. I'm going to put you an ABC fund. That's not where it begins. But I feel like coach also embodies that teamwork. Like you it have does. to give, I have to give, it's a mutual experience. And and something I've learned this past year and really doing the work on my financial, uh, my money with my finances and my, wow, that was not English. My relationship with my finances and my financial future is, is that there are people out there, there are coaches, there are advisors, there are planners, but you have to be trusting of that person, but you also have to not be afraid to share what you, what you know, what you don't know, you, you have to yes. give up that guilt and shame in order to be your most successful self and really admit that there is work to be done. And um, yeah, I think that there is this, this huge movement, especially millennial and Gen Z movement of coaching and that, whether that be business coaching, financial coaching, health coaching, self-care coaching, whatever it is, yes. I feel like we're all coming together to help each other with parts of our lives that we're best at. And I'd love to see I that. I think it's beautiful. It's I so think the millennials are more of a community mm -hmm. um, and they, and they're more accepting of the genders too yeah. and the differences in people. And that's going to benefit them in the future, that mm -hmm. attitude. So to wrap up, I know we kind of went off in a different direction, but um. Can you talk about really quickly any of the other hidden forces? Um, I'm a firm believer and you don't know what you don't know. So anything that we haven't touched on um, that that's keeping us from our most uh, most amazing financial self 
and and then we'll wrap it up with I have another question about separate so we'll keep it well you know <laughs> you know I don't want to bring in too much stuff in the first book and confuse people so I really break it down to um really the political and the economic forces but the book I'm introducing to women really talk about hidden actors mm. hidden uh risk and because the first book really talks about the hidden forces political and economic risk that have in my opinion, ruined the American dream, okay? So now I'm gonna spoon feed you into book two and talk about who those actors are mm. behind those forces, like the Federal Reserve, like corporate America, like um, the legal system. And then I'm gonna talk about hidden risk, which, you know, these new risks nobody talks about, social media risk. I mean, look at Elon Musk. I read something that 37% of what El the, the people who followed Mr. Musk, do what he tells them to do. Yeah. I mean, that's social media risk. And then you got the Wall Street risk. What were you going to say here? It's a huge part of cryptocurrency. I mean, we just saw that with Doge, Dog, Dogecoin or whatever. Dogecoin, yeah. Yeah, with uh, with the Super Bowl, as everyone was investing and waiting for the Super Bowl commercial to drop to to see it blow up, and it never did. You know, that's the risk of social media is that if you invest it all in social media, then it's, it's social media for a reason. <laughs> So, no, so I mean, that's a new risk and you shouldn't be listening to social media to make your investment decisions. Right. And then you got this, you know, the game stock was really a good thing because people need to understand that Wall Street can short the market right. and go against you. And then, I mean, I was just really happy that some investors got together and, you know, some of these hedge funds lost 50% in January. You know, they're trying to fight back these forces, these risks, the Wall Street derivatives that and these, um, you know, things that, so what I'm saying is that investing in just stocks, in my professional opinion, because of these forces, actors, and risk, people need to reconsider that. I mean, they need to understand what these asset classes are, get educated, get empowered, and, and then have somebody guide you into what's best for your investment decisions, because it's a process, it's complex, but Everyone needs to be accountable in the equation. Yes, I love that. And I love just to go back to what you were saying earlier with, with Synergy Financial is that you've opened that door up to people who, who don't have the millions of dollars. And I think yep. that that's where a lot of millennials and Gen Zs, I think that a lot of us don't even know like what a financial advisor is or what a financial planner is, or um, do we need that? Do we need a lot of money to have that? And um, I love that you open your doors to to more people to be able to experience that because like you said there's just a lot of knowledge to share so what do you foresee foresee the the future of post covid looking like with our finances with the stock market with investing um you know obviously it's prediction so we take it with a grain of salt but but how can we prepare ourselves best to move forward and be our most successful selves well Again, looking in the past, trying to find out, hey, what has the stock market done the last 10 or 20 years? And there are forecasts. What's the future forecast? I mean, these forecasts come from companies like Morgan Stanley, the Federal Reserve. These guys are accurate. So you got to look at the past. You got to forecast in the future. Find someone who has that knowledge. So, you know, we can determine what asset class during that economic cycle is best for you. I mean, the market's been up double digit the last 10 years. That doesn't mean it's going to do that the next 10 years. Right. So you really have to understand that. And I think a lot of, especially with my industry, I think there's just going to be a lot of communication through Zoom um, instead of going face to face, which is great because that's going to save us a lot of time and we'll be able to talk to more people. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, that would also make it more convenient for especially women who have their jobs, they have kids. The biggest thing women have that's against us is time because we play multi roles. And I think anything that's more convenient for a woman to get knowledge, you know, I think that's where it starts. But no, I believe in audio, um, you know, visual, whether it's webinars I'm hosting, whether it's a podcast you can follow, whether it's books you can read, you know, I built a financial literacy platform. I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on this platform of my own money because after 35 years in the industry, I thought to myself, if not a lot of planners are doing this, 
I might as well be one of the first who offers this platform a practical knowledge. I mean, I have 10 videos within my website. You can get five free videos if you go in and put your email and they come. We don't inundate you. They're eight minutes, folks. We send it each day so you can get that research because what you want is facts. You want research. So you're like, oh, now I understand. Mm -hmm. So we have 10 videos on my website. You have my books, you have podcasts, you have webinars. I'll be posting when I'll be speaking. So you have access, but can you make the time? Mm -hmm. It's huge. Time is, time is so huge. And I feel like something that we, um, that we've experienced over the last year is that time is money also. You know, wasting your time going the wrong direction can, can cost you a lot of money. I mean, that's something I experienced even with my corporate job was like the waste. It wasn't a waste of time. I learned so much, but the time yes. that you can waste, I mean, I was in my, in my car for five hours a day driving and like, I could have been meeting with clients over zoom, which wasn't accessible. You know, it, it really yes. is. And yeah. you know, another thing is a lot of millennials learn how to make sourdough. Why not learn about finances? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, don't ignore it because you don't know. Yeah. Head through it, get empowered. Cause once you start learning, you're going to say, wait a minute, I'm not going to work to 65. These are things that you have to ask yourself. Am I going to work to 70 and, or am I going to work to 55? Some of these young kids come in my office and they like, listen, I'm going to retire in 10 years, 15 years. They don't want to work as, as hard as their parents. Yeah. So th it's setting a goal and getting inspired, motivated and taking action steps to make a difference in your financial future. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. This has all been so incredible. Um, where do you advise people to start with obviously finding your book or your podcast or your videos? Um, and of course, we'll post all the resources um, for everyone as well, where they, if, of course, we have books available to give people. Um, we can also post um, the link to sign up for your emails as well. But where do you advise people starting to get involved with, with Synergy Financial and with yourself? Okay, so Synergy Financial is spelled with a C. My last name's Kumjan. Nobody knows how to say it. So Cindy looks like Synergy. So Synergy is spelled C-I-N-E-R-G-Y. So go to the website and put your email and get the five free videos. And they're eight minutes a piece. So I'm going to give you 40 right. minutes of content, all research, and you only have eight minutes a day. Then on my website, there's an order page for my book. And then if you go to my media page, you'll get all of my radio shows last year. And it's all based on subjects. So you want to learn about estate planning or insurance. Just look at the air, look at the title and click on it's a 30 minute radio show. If you want to listen to videos, go through the the um, there's additional videos outside of the five videos. So the podcasts are up there and they give you titles. So look at the podcast on areas of interest. Look at the radio shows on titles that might, you know, because it, I really break it down for you. And then uh, go to my YouTube channel. Oh my gosh, I have I have another 30 videos there. They're one minute, folks. I don't want to bore you. <laughs> 21 minute videos, because this is a lot of stuff. And then I give you 10 eight minute video videos. So I want to give you baby steps. I don't want to overwhelm you, but I want to give you any kind of source that you want to learn financial fitness, get motivated, get engaged and start with little action steps. I love it. Any lasting pieces of advice or inspiration um, to leave everyone with before we, before we end? Everything is possible. If you believe you can achieve and you can make it happen. I was an average student. I ended up picking a field I'd go to school for 15 years. If you're focused and you have a goal and your goal is to be financially free, get started today. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Cindy, for everything. So much amazing information packed into this workshop. Um, for those of you watching, um, we will also post all of the places where you can get her book, watch her videos, um, all the things so that you can have all of those resources. And then when can we expect book number two? I'm so excited. For I that. already know I'm handing book two into my publisher. It's psychological. I'm doing it on the sixth when I re release book one. See, everything's psychological. 
They go, well, the book's done. Well, I'm not handing it in to April 6th. So yeah. that book will get published March 1st, which is Women History Month next year. Amazing. I love it. That's so fantastic. Well, thank you so much for everything. Everyone go check out Cindy and her resources. And it was so awesome talking to you and getting to know you. Thank you so much for having me. And I'd love to come on anytime. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.